And a perfect example of that is back in, I believe, 1991 through 1993, and even to this day, to a certain extent, in the central corridor of Mexico, over cities that have, some of them have a million or two million population, they had daily overflights of UFOs. Some of the UFO researchers, the last one I saw, he had collected over 5,000 videotapes of broad daylight UFO sightings. That staggers the imagination. I've seen some of these videotapes. Why this never was reported north of the border is almost a stranger story than the event itself. Hmm. Because it says an awful lot about how we are manipulated in our knowledge of our place in the universe. Yeah, here's another thought that I just had. It's like when we see something new, it's exciting, you know? And then once we get used to it, we j it just kind of gets lost. So I think more people than normal see things and they just got used to it and they don't see it anymore. Uh, like for instance, where we were up at the Vainucci, um, one of the questions somebody asked that, well, then what did you do? Well, it was over, we went to bed. It was a big thing, but it was just, it happened all right. the time. Right, what could so, you do? You so couldn't find it. what else was there to do, yeah, so. That's right. There have been an estimated uh, probably 40,000 cases of UFOs reported since approximately 1947. Using statistical projection, that means that there's probably actually about 15 million cases. And of course, we all know that statistics can be used to prove almost anything. But what I'm trying to do is to just give people an idea of where this is all going. A man named Ted Phillips has collected over 4,000 physical trace cases. And that's a case where a UFO has been seen. There was some physical interaction with the environment where it was observed. And there was some kind of documentable evidence left behind that could be photographed, analyzed, collected, put away, and systematically recorded. Now, of course, this is of interest to me as an investigator because that's exactly what I do. Mm -hmm. And this is how the two things begin to become one. I use exactly the same techniques to investigate a UFO sighting that I would conducting a criminal investigation. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is, once you learn to be an investigator, you can investigate anything because you're doing the same things over and over again. You interview witnesses. You use your people skills to interact with them and to get them to cooperate with you. You try and assess their credibility. You try to take what they've told you and put it into some kind of larger perspective so that it makes sense. And you try and back it up with physical evidence and photographs. And you take all of that and you put it together into a report form so that someone else who doesn't know anything about the event that you're investigating can come back and reconstruct everything you've done. Now there, in a nutshell, is my 30 second explanation of how you investigate anything. Mm -hmm. It takes someone with logic, it takes someone with people skills, and it takes someone with curiosity and an open mind. And a hunch. And a Don't hunch. Don't forget the hunch. Right. Yeah. That's, of course, women call <laughs> it women's intuition, and macho men are supposed to call it gut instinct. Instinct, I yes. have a gut instinct. Well, there are a lot of things going on right now that are really peculiar. And we're told one thing. We're told that UFOs don't exist. We're told that the Roswell crash was nothing more than Project Mogul. And then, of course, they had to come up with a real quick explanation for the 50th year anniversary. So they had someone drop a dummy off of a balloon, and that was supposed to be the explanation for how all of this occurred and how all these people got so excited <coughs> and why they had the military inside the town of Roswell and why people were intimidated into silence, and why there's been an ongoing cover-up for so many years. We're told that none of this is real. It's all mere science fiction. It's just something that we make up. Well, I'd like to give you a couple of ideas of some very odd things that are going on. Somebody gave this to me, <laughs> and I thought at first they were trying to test my credibility. Yeah. This is called the Fire Officer's Guide to Disaster Control. This is a photocopy of the front cover, and within this document, 
I photocopied a particular chapter. Now, why is this important? This is a textbook. I remember when you brought that to my attention. Exactly. Yeah, and I thought that was really awesome that it, it would is. be in this it's, textbook. It's mind-boggling. Yeah. The book is written by William M. Kramer, mm -hmm. Ph.D., District Fire Chief, Cincinnati Fire Division, Director of Fire Science, University of Cincinnati, co-authored with Charles W. Bame, Juris Doctorate, Deputy Fire Chief, L.A. Fire Department, retired, Captain, United States Naval Reserve, retired, and attorney at law. Now these are two guys that obviously are going to spend a lot of time perpetrating hoaxes. Well, you look at this book, and I did. I went to my local Timberland library, and I made them get me the book. And they did, very quickly, and I brought it home. And it was a nice-looking textbook. I even called the publisher and priced it. It was about a uh, better part of $60. It was in its second edition and probably headed for its third. And it has a lot of chapters inside that were things that you would normally expect. There's chapters on fire and flood and earthquake and how to set up a command center and how to marshal your resources in the event of an emergency to take care of sick and injured people. All perfectly logical topics and a lot of it pretty much dry as dust unless you were involved in that particular line of work. And this is a textbook that is actually used. I went to my local fire chief and I asked him about these two gentlemen, William Kramer and Charles W. Bem. I asked him if he'd heard of this book. Yeah, and I he, remember that. He had. Yeah. And he said that these are, these are two highly respected authorities in the field. So then I look through the table of contents and everything seems pretty good. And I get down to chapter 13 and I can't help but think that, you know, using the number 13, somebody had a sense of humor. Chapter 13 is called Enemy Attack and the UFO Potential. Now that kind of threw me. And I went through the chapter and we see what is war, causes of war, effects of a nuclear attack. That seems pretty sensible. World War II nuclear attacks, preparation for enemy attack, fire department preparation general. Okay, that's all well and good. But it's the last half of the chapter that really gets mm -hmm. to me. The UFO threat, a fact. Adverse potential of UFOs. UFOs, emergency action, conclusion, and references. This blew me away because if you read this chapter, you get a good short course in UFOs like what we're trying to do here today. Yeah. Now, why are two people like that talking about it if none of this is real and it isn't happening? Just the other day, one of the administrators at the department where I work, he brought me an advertisement. And I looked at this thing. It's something they send to captains and chiefs to try and get people interested in you know, training exercises to help develop their skills as administrators. And it's got a nice cover. It says training ideas, resource guide, and product catalog. And I go along in this, and it's got all of these interesting little things that you can buy where you can act out scenarios. And it has one called the alien encounter exercise. Comes with videotape. And it says, dramatizes key elements of the communication process, develops effective decision-making skills, builds understanding and strengthens team interaction, and increases intercultural awareness and sensitivity. I should hope so. But they're selling this to people. We're being acclimated. There's a very strong argument that over time, we are being deliberately accustomed to the idea of alien contact. We're being softened up. Well, look at all the commercials in the last few years, you know. Everything was alien. That's why I'm playing with this. Oh, yes. And it gets all people to see something. And I I find it in my travels, you know, and they, they spot things out of the corner of the eye, and it's just an alien. They just keep going because, because they're so used to it, you see. Yeah. Well, it gets even better because it turns out that one of the best sources of documentation for the whole UFO phenomena is through the Freedom of Information Act. Yeah. 
And that's been an incredible tool that has benefited every re UFO researcher because what we've done, there's an old phrase about hoisting someone on their own petard. I guess that's like impaling them on the lion spear. And that's what the UFO investigators have attempted to do because we've taken their own documents and turned them back on them. The Freedom of Information Act, for those people who are not aware of it, allows every citizen in the United States to ask for any federal document providing that they can't put a heading of national security on it. Mm -hmm. And the UFO researchers, as soon as this law was passed, they jumped on it and they said, well, we need to get involved. You know, this Freedom of Information Act is a great opportunity. So they asked the FBI. They said, FBI, we want all the documents that you have on the subject of UFOs. And the FBI said, that's ridiculous. We've never investigated UFOs. We're not involved in yeah. UFOs. How can you possibly suggest such a thing? Well, the result was 1,800 pages of the FBI not being involved in UFOs. And, of course, they, in the process of not being involved in UFOs for 1,800 pages, it turned out that this non-involvement, they were also partnered up with their buddies across the way at the CIA. And the CIA, they turned out about eight or 900 pages of not being involved in UFOs, mm -hmm. and they went through the same process. And eventually, they got a whole series, this alphabet soup of agencies that nobody even knew existed. The National Security Agency, a lot of people knew about that. But they ended up coming up with agencies like DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Proje Projects Administration. There's the uh, Defense Intelligence Directorate. There's, you name it, a whole alphabet soup of black budget agencies. And in fact, there's an excellent book by Tim Weiner called Blank Check that talks about black budget funding and how every year when they start debating the budget and talking about how the tax money is going to be spent and whether or not they're actually going to balance the budget, in all reality, there's a whole big section of it that's like an iceberg floating under the water and that's black budget funding. So you can add another half or even more to whatever the national budget is, that's the real amount of money they're spending. And black budget means that they are not accountable to anyone other than people who are already within their own group. And all intelligence agencies work off of two principles. You have to have a clearance to have access to a particular level of information. And secondly, you have to have a need to know well, the end product of all this, I want to show a book here that's called, I think, I tried to think what would the two most important UFO books be if I had to, if my house was burning down and I had to drag two UFO books outside with me, what would they be? Well, one of them would be this book called Clear Intent, the government cover-up of the UFO evidence by Lawrence Fawcett and Barry Greenwood, and one of these two gentlemen is also a retired cop, so I guess that's why I have a little bit of affinity. But the beauty of this book is that it's completely documented and footnoted. And what is it documented and footnoted with? Documents that were obtained from our own government through the Freedom of Information Act. I see, it looks like the yellow pages you wrote all through it, so oh, yes. I guess you this, can't this leave with home without it, huh? No, this is a very, <laughs> very important book. Yeah. And there are stories in here that will make the hair stand up on the back of your neck, things that absolutely boggled my mind. I could not believe that I was getting that kind of a UFO story from an unimpeachable source. That's what's staggering. See, the information is all around there. We're told that it isn't true, you know, no reasonable, sensible person believes in aliens, etc. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not the case. In 1995, when I attended the MUFON Symposium in Seattle, I found out that most of the people that I met there were from all walks of life. And that's another truth about UFO encounters, that a statement that needs to be made. People who see an, uh, UFOs or who have encounters of one kind or another are not kooks, nuts, drug addicts, alcoholics, weirdos, spaced out people, whatever you want to call them. There may be a few of those who have encounters. 
Yeah, I want to say something about that. You know, it's not that you just get up one morning and says, today I'm going to have an encounter. It's like we talked about the spear being in the right place at the wrong time. Exactly. And so <laughs> you, you, you can you can kind of plan this. They are um, absolutely normal people going about their business. They walk around a corner and suddenly they find themselves in an event that is so strange that it has no normal context in which to put the event. And this has a lot of different effects on people. Some people it's shattering. Some people put up the blinders and pretend it didn't happen. Some people do end up resorting to drugs and alcohol as a result of their paranormal experiences. Um, I like to add something to this. This is a very a, a large sus, um, sus. I'm sorry. Help me. Not subject. And I don't think we can cramp it all in the time that we have allowed for ourselves. So can we talk about David Chase's book for a minute? Because I really don't think we're going to do the slideshow today. You'll just they just have to tune in the next time. That may very well be possible, and it uh, might yeah. and it might be actually better to do it that way. That we have this time to do a background yeah. and build up to the presentation of some more substantial evidence. This gentleman, David Chase, I've met him several times. He's a fascinating artist, and I've also found that every time I've asked this man a question, he had a, an excellent answer for me immediately. And he does all of these drawings, and what these drawings are, are, are they're of the basic types of extraterrestrial beings that people are reporting all over the world. The reptilians, the Nordics, the greys, the mantis types. You would think that if all of this was an illusion and there was no reality to any of these events, that there would be as many different types of aliens as there would be people experiencing them. I, I was in Greenville and uh, a woman and her four children asked me to come over and they thought he was having nightmares, you know. And uh, so then after I got there, one would start the dream and another person ended and I found David Chase's book real helpful to, uh, to put a face on some of those beings that, that, that we see. Um, May I see the one, Certainly. the mantis? That's my favorite. He has an I think. extraordinary talent. He's just wonderful. Okay, I'll find it. Well, while you're looking for that yeah. drawing, the point that I was trying to make was that some alien abduction experts have pointed out that the accounts that they are getting from people are almost boring in their repetitive okay. sequence of events and the types of beings and situations in which these abductions are occurring. And I know that the word alien abduction to people who are not well versed in this subject, that immediately Oops. sets the hair up on the back of their neck and they think, you know, who is this kook and why is he talking about it? I would refer them to the work of a man named John Mack. Oh yeah, that's even better. Exactly. I, I can't find him anywhere. Who has so. multiple degrees and is on the board in charge of psychiatry for the Harvard Medical School, and he spent the better part of two years in a civil suit defending his job simply because he wrote a book called Abduction. And he said that people who are involved in the subject of alien abduction, the victims of this, they are not people who are suffering from any kind of break with reality. They're not psychotics. These are people who have been subjected to some kind of extraordinary external event. And people of high strangeness. If so so we should kind of leave there as a cliffhanger, what would you say? I think that would be perfect. I can find the mantis in here, so maybe I was mistaken as well, to... Well, I'm quite sure that he's in here. As to whose book he is in. We do um, have some extraordinary pictures in here, like the reptilian. That's, that's one that's frequently reported, a, a rather ominous type of alien being. I'm not quite sure how we're going to fit this in, but one of the things that I do need to focus on is that there was one very peculiar document that was obtained in the Freedom of Information Act from the National Security Agency. 
and it was a briefing paper. And the beauty of this briefing paper is that it basically does my job for me. And it's nice to know that my tax dollars are well spent and that the National Security Agency is helping me to prepare my UFO lectures. I really appreciate their assistance. They had a briefing paper in amongst all this other stuff. Of course, a lot of the stuff they got from the National Security Agency under Freedom of Information Act, you would get one piece of paper and all of it is blacked out. They tell you nothing. They just give you the piece of paper with the page number on the bottom. It's all black and they say, well, this is, what, this is all we're allowed to tell you. But they did have a briefing paper. And it was written in 1968. And they had five possibilities for what UFOs are. Number one, they said, what if all UFOs are hoaxes? They dismissed that as a possibility. They said hoaxes in history have a low frequency of occurrence. They're seldom perpetrated by reputable people. And the UFO phenomena has been shown to be exactly opposite to that. It's worldwide. There are increased reports from all area, and the witnesses are highly credible. In fact, I've even spoken to witnesses who were in the military. I even got a great UFO story from an FBI agent. Hypothesis two, all UFOs are hallucinations. They said that doesn't match the cases where the witnesses and equipment agree. Examples are when UFOs decide to let themselves be seen on radar and when UFOs are photographed by gun cameras. Mm -hmm. I would add just parenthetically that gun camera film by aircraft that were sent over the United States in the 50s and 60s is still classified, even though the camera, the film, and the aircraft have all been replaced by 50 superior models since then. We're still not allowed to see that gun camera film because some of those flights were deliberately sent out to see if they could contact UFOs. Possibility three, all UFOs are natural phenomena. If you hear about a man named Philip Class and an organization called PSYCOP, they will tell you that that's all that UFOs are. Now, the NSA pointed out that if that was true, that raised some very dangerous questions about our ability to discern the difference between incoming missiles and enemy attack and any other event that might occur. They didn't think that that was true because trained observers, as in their own people, the military, airline pilots, police officers, and I could go on and on, have observed UFOs as apparently solid objects that travel at extremely high speeds. They are high performance vehicles and they operate at altitudes in ways that most other aircraft can't and don't. And they can defy radar at will and also create electromagnetic interference. So they said that doesn't work. The la number four, and they only spent about two little sentences on this one, they said that UFOs are secret earth projects. Well, you've got to bear in mind whose briefing paper this is. This is the National Security Agency. They're not about to talk about that because if there is a secret earth project that can fly like that, they're probably flying it or they know all about it. Their job is to know what everybody in the world is doing. And what we need to do now is kind of close off the show and tell everybody thank you and wind it up and we are looking forward to our next project that we're going to tape right immediately after and we're going to go into a, a slideshow that we set up for and I think it's really wonderful that you came. I hope that um, you come and visit us again and this wonderful presentation and uh, when you go home just make sure you look up and when you see something you call me. I certainly will. Yeah, and you tell your lovely wife I said hello and and some of the friends in Aberdeen. Is there anything you'd like to add? Do you have anybody you want to say hi to real quick since we have a couple of minutes here? No, just that I would invite anyone who has information anywhere who sees this tape, if they have any information about early events at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base mm -hmm. or Roswell or anything like that, now is the time to come forward and go out in the open. This is, there has never been a better time. Don't be afraid anymore.
Yeah. Um, by the way, the phone number for the UFO hotline is 206-322-3000. If you see anything, Excuse me, 722-3000. Oh, I'm sorry. You got the last word anyway. There you go. Thank you very much for joining me. We have crop circles. Are you familiar with those? Fatima Lilian Mustalier. To make it easier, the friends call me Lilian. I'm very happy that you came to join me again on another visit with James Clarkston. Um, we did a show a, a while back and we wanted to do a little touch up here to remind the friends what we talked about and then you're going to surprise us with a wonderful slideshow. That's my intent, Lily, and there's just so much on the subject of ufology, especially what's going on right now. You just can't get it all into one program. I'm not even sure we could do it in two. Probably not. They've been working on it for so many years, so, you know, it's 